from the nation's capital, this is the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast with your host, Rob Snowett. This is episode 243 of the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast, brought to you by Corkers. My name is Rob Snow White. Yes, that's my last name. It's been about two days since I've had to explain to somebody, yes, that really is my last name. Mac is the first person to introduce me to fly fishing and fly tying. My dad would take us out to the Shenandoah River with my brother when I was in elementary school and middle school, and Mac and my brother would wait out. I was too small at the time to wade across the fast water so I would fish along the shoreline but I would watch Mac throw his fly line with a small black leech and pick out smallmouth and red-eyed google bass all day long. Mac graduated from South Lakes he went to West Point so I didn't get to hang out with him too much being he was so far away. There was weekend where everyone gathered at a friend's weekend house in Paw Paw West Virginia. People had a little bit too much to drink but Mac and I regardless still woke up Early in the morning, before everyone else, walked down to the river, strung up our rods, and caught a bunch of fish while everyone was still sleeping. We got back just in time to get the first bacon coming off the griddle. I think the last time that Mac and I fished together was in Keystone, Colorado, before our friend Brian's wedding. I can't think of a better person to have had as my fly fishing mentor, the person to get me into this, than Mac Hodel. He's a remarkable person. And this is just an hour conversation where you get to hear about Mac and what he's been up to. Like I said, this podcast is brought to you by Corkers. The Corkers brand was born 60 years ago on the treacherous banks of the Rogue River in Oregon, where I hope to fish one day. The original river cleat was handmade out of rubber and spikes. The functional design quickly grew as a favorite among fishermen, and the rest is history. Corkers also makes amazingly comfortable boots. Right here, I've got my new pair of Devil Canyons, and I absolutely love the smell of a new pair of boots, especially these. The back of them has got neoprene, doesn't give me any friction against my calf or the back of my ankle. They're tall. I get full ankle support. I've said in other podcasts, I can wear these all day. The toe box is solid. I'm not going to damage my toes at all. People also will ask me if I worry about the wire system failing. I tell them if you're worried about any of your gear, especially a boa lace breaking on a trip, just bring your repair kit. Bring extras of anything you think that might go wrong. Do you bring extra shoelaces on trips? Well, if you do, you're the same kind of person that would have a boa lace. It's not more of a risk to break them than any other type of gear you may be out there with. It's also not difficult to repair a pair of boas. It comes with a kit that's got everything to replace the wires and the dials. Be sure to watch an online tutorial of how to do it first if you have any questions. I absolutely love my corkers. My clients can be wearing a pair of them tomorrow. He's in town from Australia. This is brought to you again by corkers.com. And now let's have a conversation with Mac Hodel. Let's get started. We have with us, should we call you Mac Hodel, Martin Hodel, or Kip Martin? Mac Hodel. Mac Hodel. All right, and we've yeah. known each other a long time. That's right. Where That's right. are you right now? So I'm in Broomfield, Colorado. That is halfway between Denver and Boulder. And if listeners want to know what you look like, who's your celebrity doppelganger? I've heard I've heard David Bowie. That's a little weird. Not when he looks weird, but uh, – and maybe uh, a less handsome version of Karch Karai. I play volleyball, so that that throw that out there. Okay. You know me though, so who would you say? Man, it's been a long time. Maybe like uh, the cartoon uh, lead guy in the GI Joe cartoons, the blonde dude. <laughs> Even better. Yeah. Go with that. All right. So Mac, when did you all move to Reston? Boy, I was four years old. So uh, my dad was in the army. And so, uh, like many people in the area, then worked at the Pentagon. So I lived there from 1979 until the time that I went to West Point in uh, 1993. 
Those were the fun times in Reston back in the day before it was all That's built right. up and with traffic as bad as it is. That's right. Yeah. And actually, and I go back to the, the origin story here of where you learned to, to fly fish that I don't know if your listeners, I don't know if you've ever talked about it. Not really. Um, so let's, I've let's listened have... to most episodes, yeah. but not every one. So, um, yeah, it goes all the way back to in the summertime. My mom was a swim instructor and she, she burnt me out on swimming. So once I could swim and I was drown proof, then I didn't have to necessarily do swim team. And so I said, okay, I, I'm going to opt out. So every morning in the summertime, I would ride my bike over to Lake Audubon. There's no bike lanes in Northern Virginia. So you, at some risk to yourself, holding a rod case, a little kid riding a bike a couple miles. And I would uh, fish in Lake Audubon every morning from about eight in the morning until 10 30 or 11 whenever i'd get totally dehydrated and then i'd come over to your house and hang out with you and your brother and that was kind of all of july and uh, half of august i'd say you'd be surprised how much that shoreline has been allowed to grow in along the dam by the drain mm -hmm. it's hard to access that spot on foot you gotta bring a yeah. machete down there with you that's right. And one of the first challenges that I, I faced was the the flip side. There's like a tailwater coming out of that, a warm water tailwater, if you will. And it was like a spring creek. And if you go in there with bait casting or spin casting, you'll just scare everything in sight. But with the fly rod, you can really do some work and uh, just spend hours down there messing around. I just hated walking the hill to get there. All the snakes. <laughs> I actually have not seen a snake out there in a long time, being that it is technically snake den branch, but it's that damn hill, like yeah. the actual hill of a dam. That's, That's a right. 45 degree angle. Walking up that in the heat is not fun, even when I'm in yeah. shape. Yeah. So, so I learned fly fishing probably about 10 years old from my uncle and then honed it over the years. Like I said, every summer morning on Lake Audubon and then come to uh, your house and somewhere along the line uh, and I'm classmates with your older brother, but somewhere along the line, I think you would start joining in and got the bug more and more with fly fishing. And then the next thing I knew I'm in college and beyond out in the army, you know, I hear you are fishing all the time. You know, you're dabbling with working at fly shops and, and guiding and such. So I, uh, for better or worse, I think turned you on to a, uh, a lifestyle. Absolutely. You're the first person I ever knew to really fly fish. The first one that tied flies. I remember in your basement, if you went to the left, mm -hmm. there was a little workbench yep. with a vice. Good memory. Yep. Yeah. And was this the uncle that got you into it? Is that the same uncle that once went to spit tobacco out the window, the back seat and the window was closed? <laughs> no, I think I think that was a great grandfather or something. Okay. No, this this guy squeaky clean doesn't do any of that. But and yeah. I remember my brother, he first got the Cortland rod in the box, which I still have in the room yep. next door to me. And then he you guys would go to Pennsylvania. And I was That's always right. jealous that I was the obnoxious younger brother that wasn't really allowed to do a lot of the things my older brother did. Like going yeah. out to Dan's place on the weekends in high school. I never got to do that either. Oh man. Yeah, exactly. Farm ponds out there. So yeah, we would go out to, uh, yellow breaches. I, I wasn't going to take Andrew to the Latorte or falling spring or something. That would be crazy, but we'd go to yellow breaches and, and mess around. And so my, my background was, um, warm water fishing and Reston. And then the quickest way to get the trout was actually going up to the Carlisle area. So Latorte falling spring, yellow breeches. And so I, I learned by necessity to savor the challenge because anyone who's fished the Latorte knows one fish is a good day, is a great day, <laughs> a fish on a fly on the, on the Latorte. Um, people talk about how many looks they got, let alone fish they land. And then you can drive 10 minutes to yellow breeches and catch 20 fish and maybe have fun, but you don't feel the same satisfaction. And so as a kid, there's an inclination to catch more fish and more fish, and or maybe you switch and catch bigger fish and bigger fish. But by fishing some really hard waters, it made me see the value of savoring a challenge. And one difficult fish can be everything. That can be uh, more satisfying than 
30 fish on the yellow breaches. Um, not to say that's a bad stream, and there have been great days on that stream, um, but it's it for me anyway, it became about savoring the the challenge and problem solving. And just to complete the bio, after my time in the army, I became a consultant. I mean, that that's what I do professionally, and that's basically problem solving. I'm a problem solver at heart. And how I view fly fishing, it it basically allows for the exploration of problem solving. It's the most flexible approach. It allows for the most experimentation. And however deep you want to get into it or however surface level you want to be, there's always more you can explore. And, uh, and so it's, it's really the perfect pursuit, I think, for people who like being outside, but they also like understanding and they like problem solving. And so that's what I can talk about. I'm not the world's best angler by any means, but I'm I'm along my my journey of uh, developing my game and exploring new new angles. And I think it just offers endless opportunities for people that find that sort of thing satisfying. Were you able to fish at all when you were at West Point, or were you just too busy studying and spiking volleyballs? Yeah, pretty busy. But I did make it out a couple times to. Um, to the west branch of the Delaware. It's not too far away. And my um, girlfriend at the time, now now wife, thought I was insane because I would, um, with no plans for lodging, would just drive out there in a Honda Accord and park along some deserted road and sleep and then get an early start and, uh, and, how, and fly fish. <laughs> how did you fit in a Honda Accord sleeping? Well, you, you could put the seat all the way back. You, you'd be surprised. It's, I, mean, it works I remember out. having to sit on your lap in the old Honda Accord, the green machine, driving home from school, there's barely enough room for that. Y'all would shove oh, me in the car. True enough. Yeah, I think I'd rough you up along the way. I, yeah. Yeah, listeners should know, I used to get in trouble with your mom for maybe being over-exuberant in, uh, in, in rough housing. I, I had the mouth on me. I was an obnoxious kid. <laughs> Peter and I definitely deserved what came coming to us. True. So True. When, when did you get to Colorado? I've been out here for about nine years. So um, after business school, I moved to the Atlanta suburbs. I was in Marietta and actually was closer to trout. It was 15 minutes or so from the delayed harvest area on the uh, Chattahoochee, which is actually it's it's pretty cool. One, one of the avenues of, of exploration, I'd say, that that fly fishermen can can go through is exploring local waters. And I know you're big on this, urban fly fishing, and you don't always have to go to Montana. Look at what's in your backyard and, and understand it. And so for me at the time, that was the, the, the Chattahoochee. And you find there are some really interesting subcultures with the local fly fishing scene and where to go and what to try. And it's all about self-discovery. No one on the message boards gives you the whole recipe because they know that's not what it's about. It's enough to get you started. And then if you put forth the effort, I think people recognize it and they respect it. And so there's a small group, it's probably a bigger group now, but some hardcore uh, fly fishers in the Atlanta area. And so I would, uh, I'd hit the Chattahoochee during the spring and early summer. And then visited Colorado a few times, and then uh, we were able to make it happen. So I moved out here fall of 2010. And how did you have to adapt from East Coast angling and coming from the school of South Central Pennsylvania limestones to having done some urban fishing in Atlanta, but now yeah. living out in kind of high alpine, yeah, deserty area? So I think your East Coast listeners will like this and the West Coast people won't. I'd say it's harder in the East. Waters are just more pressured and fish, I think, are more demanding on presentation. By that, I mean drag-free drifts, uh, that sort of thing. My visits to Colorado, I would do phenomenally well. I'd catch a lot of fish. I'm like, man, this is great. And actually, it's kind of easy. Um, that's one thing about coming up on really hard streams. You get an appreciation for high degree of difficulty. And I'd say the Chattahoochee, a lot of stalkers, but if you want to catch bigger fish and smarter fish, some of the wild browns, and there's natural reproduction in the Chattahoochee, um, and then there are some holdovers a as well, um, that demands better presentations, 
you know, different flies. You're not throwing junk flies there. It's the Y2K. It's like a, a glow bug, basically. Uh, but throwing accurate nymphs and, and being careful about things, you could do better. So coming out to Colorado, there's different techniques. And there are some highly pressured waters here. But in general, I found things to be easier than how I found them in the in the east. When you were down at, in Atlanta, did you go to the varsity to honor your guidance counselor from South Lakes? <laughs> I think I think I went there once and then swore off ever going there again. That's a pretty greasy affair. He had a lot of varsity swag in his office. Back when you were allowed to he, smoke a pipe in high school, if you're a guidance counselor. <laughs> Yeah, people love it, and people keep the the hats and everything, varsity stuff. But if it's it's more of a tourist thing than a real eating thing, because um, it's 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 pretty heavy. So, what are your home waters now in Colorado? Yeah, so, along the lines of of local or urban fly fishing, there's a pretty interesting carp scene out in Colorado. And um, Barry Reynolds is one of the pioneers of some of the the oddball, different kinds of fly fishing. And it's really grown. The, the carp scene in Colorado is super popular. And I'm just, just beginning in that. So when I want a local fix, particularly when the rivers are high because of the, the runoff season, then it's about carp. And there's carp in most every pond and in, in the South Platte itself. And, um, and that's pretty interesting. If anyone hasn't targeted carp, I'd say look into it. Very demanding. There's a ton of information online about it. Um, and one of the most fun parts about that here is during the high water season when you can't really go after trout or the waiting is pretty stressful, I'd say, um, the cottonwood trees are giving off their seeds and they're, I guess, really rich in oil. It's a, a high nutrient seed and the ponds all have cottonwood trees by them. So you, you have these carp cruising, 10, 15, 20 pound carp cruising, and then they're eating cottonwood seeds off the surface. And so you can make dry flies with, with CDC or, or marabou or fleece and a little bit of foam, but dry flies imitate the cottonwood seed. So you're dry fly fishing to carp. And these are, these are big brawling fish and, uh, and that's a lot of fun. What's and your present. setup going to be for those? You know, you can go six weight, you can go seven weight, and you're not going to, I don't think, break a rod. So you don't need to have a special outfit, but it's not the time for your Euro nymphing rod or your, you know, four weight. Six to eight weight is probably appropriate. And are your kids going out with you when you're carp fishing locally? Or is this your escape from no? So that's the, the most kids. local. That's the most local escape. And then just personally, I'm about forty five minutes to an hour away from South Boulder Creek, and mm -hmm. that's a pretty cool stream. It does not have a road next to it. Boulder Creek, Middle Boulder Creek does. South Boulder, you got to hike a little bit, and it's got great hatches. There's a stretch above the dam, and then there's a tailwater stretch, and so that's the most local trout stream, uh, and that's a lot of fun. And I've brought the, brought the kids there uh, from time to time. How many kids and do you have now? Uh, four, four kids. I thought it was more. No, just just four. Four just is enough. Four. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll leave Kiersey with you when we go fishing if my in-laws aren't there. Oh, yeah. My, my daughters would, would love that. They love babysitting. Okay. So that I'd say the nearest um, prestige stream, if you will, f would be the South Platte. So probably – hour and a half from a lot of stretches, hour, 20 minutes, hour and a half from different stretches of the South Platte. It gets a lot of pressure. It's only an hour away from an awful lot of the Denver population. I'm a little further, but phenomenal river, highly pressured. And so the fish are pretty famous for, for being fussy, taking some small nymphs. Uh, a lot of it is midging. Um, and then yeah, sometimes during summer, you can throw hoppers and bigger dry flies. Um, so I'll, I'll try to hit that as, as often as I can. And as a result of it being the closest great option, uh, it gets, it gets pretty heavily pressured. So then what I found I had to do is, uh, find the water that others overlook, like find the skinny water. The obvious holes are getting thrashed and people are lining up and they're just 
with their indicator, throwing it again and again and getting drifts with little size 22 midge larva. And you'll catch fish that way. But that doesn't look that fun to me. So I'd say, well, forget that. I want to go explore. And so then I'd, I'd be left with some skinnier water that less obvious riffles and, and that sort of thing. But actually, that became a challenge that I embraced to try to find, hey, where can you catch surprisingly large trout? in water that people wade right by or they they overlook and on if you happen to live near places that get hammered i'd say embrace that as your challenge how do you find good spots in water that gets overlooked and it can be really shocking how big a fish you can find in a foot of water and you just look at the way it drains and if they're going to get a lot of food they could be sitting in shallow riffles and so you can throw – it's a perfect place for a dry dropper. Throw a elk hair caddis and drop off a little zebra midge or something and or a sunken trico after the trico spinner fall. So it's maybe getting on towards noon, 11.30 a.m. in the late summer. And you can, you can have a lot of fun in water that most people would just walk right past. And with these small flies, was it intimidating when you first moved out there? They're going to start throwing some itty bitty little stuff. I'd say I was used to that from Pennsylvania in terms of uh, trichos. I'd say in the east, the trico mayfly is often a size 22 to 24, at least the ones that I came across. Whereas here, it's a little bigger. It's maybe a 20 to to 22. Um, The difference was just in terms of biomass, a, a lot of these fish are getting a lot of their food overall from th- from insects that are size 18 to 22. And out here, that I'd say blue-winged olives, a kind of mayfly that hatches in the spring. It's a 18, even a 16. But then in the fall, it's about to get going now. Um, and then through November, it's more like a 22, the tiny olive or the pseudos, as they're called. And it's amazing. Fish just fill up on these things. And then you have midges all through the winter. Out here, there's a lot of tailwaters. So the rivers don't freeze up as much and the fish have to eat. And what's available? Uh, Midges. Midges are always available. So this is, again, like size 22, kind of little worm looking things. And, And that is the bulk of the diet. Whereas other streams I was used to, fish are filling up on caddis that are size 16, size 14, or some bigger mayflies, size 16, size 14. And just a lo- awful lot of the things on the menu here are small, are size 18 or smaller. So if you want to catch fish, you kind of get with the program and, uh, and, and, and you learn that. An exception that I would cite, though, would be um, leeches. There are I, I came a little late to this realization but there are a lot of leeches in the, the rivers here, and that's a great lead fly as a nymph. And it's enough of a mouthful that I saw fish that ordinarily are just – they're not moving. They are where they are, and you got to drift right down their lane with a little size 18 nymph. You can be throwing a, a size 10 leech, and they'll move a few feet out of their lane and see it coming and, and gobble it down, and, and that's a lot of fun. And, and then landed, you can drop some. Landed Mayor has exactly. been promoting that little exactly. leech of his for like two years straight now, that little itty bitty one. Uh huh. Exactly Something right. Like that. Yeah, he'll go down to a size 12, the, the Meyer mini leech. And um, I have good results just with a size 10. So it's, it's not some massive thing with a big cone head. Really simple a strip of pine squirrel fur um, and in size 10. And you can do a size 12. But that's been a huge moneymaker, and so then I'm uh, I'm able to catch some fish on bigger hooks than just size 18 beta snips all day long. Now, in a correspondence with you emailed years ago when I used to fish the yellow breaches all the time, you once said – you once caught a ma- monster up there. You said, the big fish are not going to make a splash when they're feeding on top. And that's always yep. stuck with me, that they're not going to – Bows themselves and expend that energy where the little fish are still learning. Yeah. They're just going to go up and grab something and make a big whirlpool and 
splash yeah. around. The, the counterintuitive thing that I learned from a lot of hours just messing around on the yellow breaches was the the small browns that you see out in the drift that are eating midges are nearly impossible to catch. You could see guys trying over these fish for hours. In the parking lot? And, well, not even the run. Go out in the main river. Avoid the run in the parking lot. But there's obvious fish, and they're super hard to catch. And, and by the way, they're 10 inches. And I would get a little tired of that. And so then I would throw all the way against the bank. And there's logs and shade and all kinds of good stuff. And and if you fix your eyes, and it's a little hard to see back in there, but you would see small little rise forms. And those are big browns. And so then I thought, wow, I'd rather fish for the fish that are uh, more approachable, more willing to eat. It, it takes accurate casting, but they they weren't as fussy, and they were twice the size of some of these fish that were obvious, but that were super fussy. Um, and so yeah, learning to read read rise forms is uh, is an art. So yeah, that that was a, a good insight from back then. How often were you getting up there when we were young to the breaches? Yeah, I try to go a few times in the summer, and then I always try and do at least one trip in late August. You have the white fly hatch, and I'm sure that's become a real circus production now uh, with more interest. Um, But uh, yeah, I try and do it at least a handful of times every summer. And wasn't your dad up at War College for a while? Or did you have a place— in Carlisle? Yes, yeah, so my parents actually moved. They, they they bought a place in Carlisle. So then when I was in college, when I was at West Point, when I had breaks, I could come down there. So after um yeah, after I finished my first year and I had something like a grand total of two weeks of, of vacation, and I probably spent three fourths of that at the house in Carlisle, and I would just get up at five in the morning. And then go fish hard, and you know it's hot and humid in that area. And then you know, come probably be back at the house at 11 p.m. after some spinner fall or something, and then get up and do it again, and do that four or five days in a row. And I was pretty fit and, and back then, and get after it. But that would be enough to uh, to satisfy me and tire me out. But those were long yeah, that's days. That's what I did. That's what I did for 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 fun back then, and I and I would mix in a few hours of just stalking. Probably the first stop would be the the Latort, upper Latort in the morning. That's one of the only times then or an evening if there's um, sulfurs hatching. Um, and then middle of the day, try other other stuff, be it yellow breeches or uh, big spring or something. What would you be doing for food all day? Because when you would stay with us as a kid, your breakfast would be a box of cereal and a gallon of milk. <laughs> yeah, I would uh, – probably put a hurting on a few of those um, – those deli sandwiches you could get at the uh, service station in Boiling Springs. I, I know you always comment on your trips of uh, of your food scene, and and you're pretty particular. Uh, I, I was much less discriminating. I mean, gr- grab some sandwiches from some gas station, um, but yeah, I'd be, just be going after it so hard. And um, really, water was the bigger thing. Be paying attention to hydration. Because out spring creeks in the summertime, that that is a, a tough environment. Got to pay attention to hydration, especially if you're walking the shorelines like Falling Springs, where the heat's just radiating off the grasses and fields. Oh yeah, it's like Mossy Creek. It'll just cook you. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And so, I, and I, I'd say this was about the time in my maturation where I'd kind of gotten out of my system. The let me catch as many fish as I can. I, I, I was that way as a teenager and probably kind of annoying. I remember really annoying my dad one day on the yellow breaches. Um, and he just left because I was just just hauling him in. And that was kind of funny. But you get over that. Then I got over the big fish. And, and that's when I kind of embraced the, the, the challenge. Like, let me find a really hard fish and see if I can if I can get him. And then and if I'm having a, a good day and you stay in this game long enough, you'll have some good days. Then let me switch up. If I know I can catch them with one technique, let me let me change up and try to throw streamers or try to throw dries if I've been nymphing. And there's just endless possibilities technique-wise. And there's different fish eating different things, barring a, a big blanket hatch. 
and even there's different ways you can you can fish a hatch. You can throw a streamer and catch the really big fish, act like your streamer is, is a little fish. So then I would start to experiment with different techniques as I started having good days where I thought I, you know, had figured things out as it were. So what is your process for problem solving? Do you view things like a, like a flow chart, one step to the next? Yeah. So first off, I do not have it figured out. And I'm always fascinated whenever I go on a guided trip to see how a guide thinks. And they often can't articulate it. Like the, the crustier, the saltier the, the guide, the less able they tend to be to articulate it. But you get them talking and you can kind of figure it out. So everyone has a different kind of process, first of all. I don't know that mine is right. But I'd say I, I try to understand the different rhythms. By that I mean the season, the time of day, even the, the, the flow level. The South Platte is a different stream at 100 cubic feet per second than it is at 400 than it is at 700. And there's a, a, a quote from a Greek philosopher that's kind of interesting to this point. Uh, no man ever steps in the same river twice, for it's not the same river, and he's not the same man. And so I, I like to liken that to fly fishing because I'm not the same angler. I've learned new things, new tricks, new stuff I want to try, but the river changes. So try to keep a record of, hey, what was it like when it was May and the river was running at this flow level? And oh yeah, around 6 p.m. something started happening. And and so there's a lot of trial and error and then um, just experimentation. And I would I used to be better about writing this down or or logging it in a journal and that's lapsed. Um, but I, I encourage everyone to at least try that, try it for a period and you'll learn a lot. You think you remember everything, but you don't, you go back and, and look at that. So it's about patterns and pattern recognition. Now, if you don't fish enough, the patterns really don't matter if you can't cast accurately. So take all this with a grain of salt. Sometimes it's about casting and mending and just doing the physical stuff correctly. And that's a matter of, of practice and that will result in catching fish or not. But in terms of the problem solving, I, I like to figure out different patterns and look, the only way to do it is, is time on the water and hardly any of us probably get as much of that as we would like. But that's, uh, to me, that's how I try to approach it and find a certain pattern that this feels like. Do you have an example of a place where you were getting continually skunked and then you just progressed, progressed and then figured it out? Sure. So one of the new challenges that I, I'm trying is uh, Euro nymphing. And I think you've had a pot or two about this. Mm -hmm. For those that don't know, it's like basically imagine you're not using fly line. You're using a really, really long leader, a long, soft rod, and you are in no strike indicator. So that, so you have a direct connection to your nymphs and, and so you have ultimate control over your drift. This is really about visualizing the drift and perfecting the presentation. And I just, uh, it just takes practice. And, and I realized I kind of wasn't doing that. So I'd say over the course of the last year, I've been at it more and more. And I had the first really good day doing this in Colorado earlier this spring. The, the, the midges, there's a, a spring midge that starts to get active come uh, it's March, April timeframe. And I kind of had it dialed in at the right time. This was not as much about fly selection. It's just got to be small, look like a little worm, but it's about the drift and how you are manipulating your, your nymphs through the drift. Are they at the right level of the water column? And it was just trial and, and error of what does it feel like to have a good drift? Um, that's probably the most recent example that, that comes to mind for, for me. Do you have any Euro nymph patterns that you're favoring more than others? You know, the, the thing about the Euro nymphing style, if you look at the patterns, like they really look pretty ridiculous. I mean, they don't look like bugs th that I've seen. And so it's almost, it almost speaks to the importance of that game is about presentation and putting something reasonable in front of fish and that's it, behaving the right way. So it's more about the, 
the weight of the fly and the profile. And so uh, I, yeah, I'm just using the, the basics and then you know, ponied up the money for some tungsten beads and, and the jig hooks, which, which do better at riding upside down. They don't snag, but the patterns are super, super simple. That's all about presentation. And what I'm trying to build up enough muscle memory on is what is it like to do that when the river is low? What is it like to do it when the river is high and, and the different approaches and, and how much weight you need in what situation that's what it's much more about versus fly selection. So when the water's low, you're right on top of these fish because there's not a whole lot of distance in that technique with the casting and drifting. So are you being super sneaky? Like yes, sneaking some up on them, hiding sure. behind bushes? Some of it's stealth, but um, that's where people will talk about so-called floating the cider. And so you'll actually cast upstream a little ways because you can't just walk up and fish 10 feet away from something and just reach out and touch it with your rod. And in certain conditions, that won't work. And so you have to adapt. And so you do cast upstream a little bit more and learning to cast when you don't have heavy fly line helping you. That's another, that's another skill altogether. But, um, I, that's something I'm, I'm trying to learn because it was a, uh, it was a good snowpack year here, but for a long time, the rivers were running low that the, the water managers weren't really, um, opening up the, the releases. And so things were, were kind of skinny. And it demanded stealth, and you couldn't just walk up like you see on YouTube, people euro nymphing. Um, that would not work. So it's a combination of figuring out how to cast and how to work at distance, not just uh, ten feet away. And my take on euro nymphing is that you just have this jig riding, hook up, you know, the jig head down, and it just looks like a bug scurrying along the bottom. Is is that sort of like the right? interpretation that you're trying to have a trout see that it's not so by, much drifting yeah. but it's more like scurrying and running along the bottom so by and large yes now again i am no expert in this i'm uh, just learning i would say if people are interested the best information source i've run across the most thoughtful person is on the trout bitten blog a guy dominic uh writes that and he lives in state college uh, Pennsylvania or, or that, that area. And there's a, there's a lot of, um, thinking coming out of that region of the country as far as different techniques. Um, so, so, so go there, but my perspective, I'd say having a bug scurrying along the bottom, that's the basic, but you can also have, have droppers. You can have tags off your leader at different, at different points. So one experiment to run is, okay, let's say I have a something that looks like a size 16 mayfly nymph or, or something scurrying along the bottom. But I can have above that two feet above or three feet, whatever I can have a dropper. So for those that don't know what I mean, um, you can tie a knot and have a tag end come out. So you're fishing two nymphs, you know, so, and you can pick at what point you want that to happen. Is that one foot above or is that two feet above? So I could have something two feet above that, that bug on the bottom, which is imitating a caddis pupa. And the idea there is that's in higher in the water column. And if I'm noticing, I'm getting more fish on that bug that's higher in the water column and less fish on the one that's deeper then I learn something. I say, okay, at this time of day and this season, they are looking up a little bit. They're looking at the emerging pupa, and you know, and or maybe I'm catching all the fish on the bottom fly, and so then I learn something from that too. So you can run. It's not just about scurrying the bottom. You can kind of run some experiments at different different parts of the water column and see how it works. I still don't think I'm ready to jump into that. I just don't have <laughs> an application around here to do that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And since I don't seem to be getting out west as often as I'd like. I know. Just just let me know. We have we have a guest room. Yeah. Well, how far are you from Breckenridge? Uh, it's probably a couple hours. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, yeah. Have, I'll, I'll just drive up to you first and we'll fish and hang. Very good. I'll Very bring good. You a, 
gallon of milk yeah. and a box of cereal. <laughs> yeah, I, I've eased up on that since. Uh, my metabolism slows down, but uh, I guess now now that I think about it, you asked about other examples of experimentation. I, I actually, I just got back from a trip, only time I've ever done this, but I, t I took a trip to Alaska. It was, it was phenomenal, but with, I'll get to the point. Um, it was during the, the silver salmon run. And the deal with silver salmon is there'll be a whole lot of them stacked up in these sloughs as they work their way up the river to the skinnier water where, where they'll spawn. And so if you know where to go or your guide knows where to go, you find a bunch of fish stacked up and, and then there's, you know, you're throwing leeches or streamers, either black or, or bright, bright pink. Um, but, but most of them are just resting. And so that game is about varying the kind of retrieve to trigger some instinct into those things to strike. And, and it's funny, you'll see dozens of fish stacked up and then one of them, all of a sudden the light bulb goes off and he tears out after your fly and just inhales it. And the, the best guides that, that we worked with, they were really thoughtful about varying the retrieve. Are they liking a jigging kind of up and down? Are they liking something that's erratic? Are they liking something that's slow and pulsating? And it changes throughout the day. And it changes in terms of, is this fish fresh from the ocean? Like this morning he came in from the bay or has he been sitting in this slough for a couple of days and he's gotten a little lethargic and those fish react differently. And so all through the day, you're just experimenting with, with different retrieves, more so the retrieve than, than the fly selection really. And, and you, it's amazing at a certain point in time, you kind of crack the code and then you'll be hooking up like mad and nothing lasts forever. And then that changes. And so it's a process of kind of dialing in different patterns, different re retrieves. And sure enough, sometimes uh, you, you, you hit the mark. How great is it to hook into a wild Alaskan salmon on a fly? Oh, it's unbelievable. And, and in the morning, we were actually throwing poppers. We were throwing what? foam foam gurglers for silver salmon yeah yeah a lot of them may ignore it but then all of a sudden out of the pack one particularly ornery silver salmon will just bum rush it and and slurp it down and then you're fighting a 15 pound salmon on a foam gurgler which was not what i uh, expected really i knew i'd be throwing leeches and that sort of thing did you get in any steelhead and other fish while you're there? Any dollies? Oh, yeah. So in general, we would um, – and you could do whatever you wanted to do. And some people wanted to go after silvers all day long. But me being the kind of nerdy consultant I am, I'd get a little tired of that and say, okay, I caught a ton of amazing fish. Let's try something different now. And so we'd go further upriver and go after trout and sometimes main river, sometimes side channels. And the game there is you have salmon spawning. In this case, it was chum salmon and some sockeye that were spawning in these channels. And then the trout are posted up downstream, eating the eggs that, that spill. Or when the salmon are fanning off, you're know, making the spawning bed, they disrupt nymphs and, and, and sculpin and that sort of thing. So you can catch them on, on a few things. And so that was a lot of fun, sight fishing, sight nymphing to trout that are in the midst of the, of the salmon spawn. And the game there is trying to pick out the big trout because if you just throw in a cast, a little eight inch Dolly Varden will race over and gobble it down. It's kind of like bluegill fishing where there's stunted bluegill. You know you can catch a fish every cast if you wanted. The challenge in this case was spotting a, a nice rainbow and getting a good cast there. So you get him and not all, all the little dollies or getting a big dolly and, and and not the little dollies. So that that was one kind of challenge. The other was fishing flesh flies for big rainbows. So in the midst of all this madness, all these fish coming in from the ocean, you have uh, fish that have done their thing. They've spawned and now now they're decaying. They're kind of swimming around moldy and that's a little bit eerie when they bump into you. But you have these moldy fish and then they eventually die and then the carcasses start to rot. 
and then little gobs of flesh start kind of peeling off and you have rainbow trout that are posted in different spots where then they, they eat the drifting flesh. And so so at that place, matching the hatch was either bookends of the life cycle. You're throwing eggs or you're throwing decaying flesh, uh, kind of, kind of grisly, but, um, yeah, it was a lot of fun. So then you're, you're picking drop offs and you're finding good spots where a big rainbow would likely be downstream of some spot where there's a lot of carcasses and it works. And so that, that was kind of cool and, and kind of, kind of gory when you think about it. And I don't take you as much of a pegging beads kind of guy, right? I, hey, first time I'd ever done it. So I mentally, I justified it in terms of the way the rig was. I mean, barbless hook, you could release them quickly. And um, so it was good. They weren't taking them deep. But also, it was a big sight fishing game. It was a lot of skill involved. And so, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't have any sort of moral qualms with it. All right. Coming from the, the classic dry fly sort of Pennsylvania to pegging eggs, covered all. <laughs> hey, I, I was matching the hatch. Yes. Either, either eggs or rotting flesh. Other than Alaska, do you get up to Wyoming or over to some tailwaters in Nebraska? Where, 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 do you, where are you thinking of fishing when you're at your desk? Yeah. Any distant that's, spots that, that are entertaining to and you. That happens every day. So the, the beauty of Colorado, there's a lot of, of cool options all throughout the state. So one is the, the Colorado River itself. I just get a kick out of it because it's it feels surreal. Like the landscape, it's like old cowboy Indian movies. You know, it, growing up in the east, it looks like nothing you're used to. And it just feels different. It feels cool being out there. And the fish are often they, they rise pretty freely. And so you can throw caddis and stone flies. You can nymph also, but you can have a lot of fun with dry flies on the Colorado. So but that's three hours from where I am, so that's a, a little tougher. The other thing that I do try to do every year is going back country to high mountain lakes. And so um, and the further away from from civilization, the the better it is generally. And so that's kind of cool. You're following a stream up to its its origins, and you see the the snow fields even in August. There's still snow up there, and you see where these rivers come from. And then some of the lakes, there's there's really good fishing, and so it's the, um, and they can be surprisingly selective late in the season and demand a good good presentation. But that's really fun. And some lakes will be a lot of small fish because the spawning habitat is good. Some lakes will be a few fish, but they're big, surprisingly big. And, and so there's variety lake by lake. And you get back there and you're backpacking. So there's a lot of variety. And, of course, it's pretty. But that's, that's another good challenge. You took Andrew up there a couple years ago, right? He got a cutty? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that was in Rocky Mountain National Park. The southeastern part of that park, there's there's tons of good uh, good fishing there. Was he still scared of mountain lions? <laughs> I think he was more afraid of bears. Uh, of the group that goes every year, half of the folks really don't care, and then half are super diligent about putting the food in these bear canisters and hiding it hundreds of yards away. So there's always a tension of uh, which part of the group wins out on on diligence. But yeah, Andrew is definitely uh, more on the side of, of being diligent He's with, with soft. The, the wildlife. <laughs> All his worldly travels and stuff, I don't get it. But he, he was out yeah. on the boat not too long ago. He did a little fishing. That's right. That's awesome. Yeah. I think he said catching that trot with you, he was good for another dozen years of not fishing. <laughs> Yeah, I found I found a pod by a uh, an outflow creek or an inflow creek, one of the two. But that's always a magnet, and so I was like, "Here, cast this in that direction, and I guarantee you'll you'll hook up." Like this is a this is a good spot. Nice. Speaking of cutthroat, have you gotten a greenback yet? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you see a lot of brook trout up in the high mountain areas, and that's basically uh, alien species here. It's an East Coast fish but it got transplanted and the natives are the greenbacks and there's uh, active efforts to restore those fish. 
So um, if you want to catch and, and cook up fish, if you're fishing back country, then you can do a little research and find where there's brook trout and the state is happy for you to uh, eat as many as you can because they did, they don't want to poison the lakes and start over. They'd rather have them fished out, but they are an invasive species and they're trying to reintroduce the native greenbacks. And then those lakes, of course, it's strictly catch and release because those fish are, uh, are, uh, I don't know if they're formally endangered, but they, uh, they're, they're not plentiful. They're trying to reintroduce them. Uh, so that was really cool to, it's like catching a native brook trout in the East, catching a, a greenback cutthroat out here is a, is a special thing. So I bumped into a guy this summer who used to catch brook trout with his dad on difficult run back in the day. I've heard that. I, I've heard that they had brook trout spawning and, and difficult run. It's hard to imagine now. Yeah. That, that that's been amazing. awesome. So yeah. close. Yeah. My father-in-law goes to the hatchery lakes and ponds and catches his limit of three a day rainbows. And he's like, yeah, they, they taste all the same. I'm like, why don't you just go catch 20 brook trout and fry those up instead? He says it's too much work. I, just, I don't uh, bother arguing. <laughs> he's an old Russian man with his ways. You know, he'd yep. still rather pump up his car tires with a bike pump than go to the gas station. You can't get him to change his mind. Yep. I told him he could take all the brookies he wants. And they're from what I've been told, taste a lot better. Oh yeah. They're, they're, they're delicious. It's just, uh, the effort of cleaning them. Uh, you know, like if they're a little bigger, it makes it worth the while, but no, those, those are tasty. The, the backcountry camping scene is uh, is really cool. It's a lot of fun. I know in some circles that's uh, that's heresy talking about eating a trout, but in some places it's it's not bad if it's an alien species, basically. Right. Um, so it's it's a lot of fun. Now, did the kids go out with you fishing? I, I have done that, but you got to be smart about it. That was more of a car camping trip in uh, Rocky Mountain National Park. The stuff I'm talking about is is getting back. I mean, you're you're hiking for five to seven miles. That's a getting, lot of whining from kids. Getting, yeah, that's right. So you, you got to be smart about it and don't don't be too aspirational or you'll burn them out. And I I, I have not mastered all of that, but um, trying to get better. And actually, just last summer, did a, a short little hike on some local mountain creek by winter park and my middle daughter caught a, a really nice brook trout. I said, Hey, cast right there. And she did. And sure enough, bang on a little streamer, this, this brookie. So that was, that was a lot of fun. And it was a, a 20 or 30 minute hike. So I thought that was, I, I managed that one. Uh, well, wasn't too ambitious. Have they been out here to fish on the East? Um, well, my son is a college student. He's a Wait, sophomore what? at, yeah your kids in I've college already i have I've that's two right you guys got started early i have two in college so my oh my, my son yeah he's a sophomore at bucknell and there's a lot of good trout water in pennsylvania so last year for fall break i went up and hung out with him and so we hit penn's creek and uh little juniata and and had fun in, in that area it makes me feel old if you're i mean Caleb's a freshman right now in Herndon. I do hold him going to Herndon against him. <laughs> but yeah, it sounds like he could uh, whoop up his old man too. He sounds he's like big uh, and his voice is deep and yeah, yeah. He's all into anime and video games though. I can't really get him out to fish. He's one of those kids. Uh, you need to get your daughter to shame him. Yeah, he, yeah. he did a little fishing on the boat though. That's good. That's I'm good. Proud. And then the kids took turns rowing. So I kind of got a light Even bulb better. in my head. I'm like, well, <laughs> we're going to have to do this more often. Yeah, tell Caleb it's some workout thing and and you may be able to uh, coax him into to rowing for you. Yeah. And, you know, my parents don't live on Glade anymore, so they're over on Lake Ann. Uh, so we're okay. trying to figure out some fishing over there with the limited foot access now. Yeah. It's a, uh, it was a good thing growing up uh, around a lake, or at least you guys having a house right by a lake. And then yeah. I would just come, come crash. Cause you, you learn an awful lot. And so I'm, uh, I'm always interested when I see that you take clients out from time to time. 
on those very same lakes. Uh, it's a special thing. Can you tell people that aren't from Reston just how awesome it was to grow up there? Oh, yeah, well, it's funny. I, I get more credit from my kids now about how cool it was to grow up in the 80s because they all watch Stranger Things. Right. And, and they're like, are you serious? This is what it was like. And, of course, not really with the aliens and whatnot. But and we had the I bunny man. The thing that they like, the sense that kids would ride their bikes and had a certain degree of, of freedom – and everyone didn't have cell phones, and so there were loose rules about being back before dark or whatever. I mean, it's kind of crazy. You think about I would ride my bike down roads that were not appropriate, and then I would go fish with no food or water or whatever and do that every day for the whole summer. Um, that's – compared to what kids get to do now, that's an insane amount of freedom. And so – and they almost can't comprehend that. And then they watch Stranger Things and, and the kids are biking around and doing whatever. And like, wow, that'd be so cool. So, yeah, it's the ability to to ride your bike around and, and explore. And not that it's the boondocks, but we I think we lived maybe 15 minutes away from the boondocks at, at the time. Those areas are now bustling and and all built up. Um, but, yeah, it was a, a pretty cool time to, to, to be a kid, I think. And when it got dark, not having street lights, it was dark. I oh, tell yeah. my kid I can walk around in the house in the dark because I grew up, you know, my house was in the woods with no lights around it, and there were no street lights. I, I had to use the moon to light me up walking home from my neighbor's house as a kid. It was dark. Yeah, you say that stuff now, and people look at you like you're kind of weird, but um, <laughs> it's it's hard to imagine, but but true. Have you brought them to Reston, your kids? I think I did, and they were kind of laughing at me. I was pointing out different landmarks, and so it, it became an unintentional comedy at how dorky I was um, as I pointed out things to them. So, yeah. And then one time I had a consulting project where I was in Herndon, and so right next to Reston, for those that don't know – and so I said, wow, let me go back and look at my old house where I grew up. And I, I think I freaked the people out that lived there because they saw some random rental car <laughs> driving down some quiet street. It, it pretty much backfired. And my my kids told me that I was being creepy. So i um, been back a little bit. Yeah, that area around Fox Mills has not changed at all. They yeah, put a bike exactly. lane in on lawyers. Well, that would have helped. That yeah. would have helped in the, the late 80s as I was risking life and limb every morning anything else i should ask you about colorado anything you had no. in your mind no I'd just say um i think for those who are listening presumably you're interested in fly fishing and what i'd say is like no one has it figured out everyone is on some kind of journey and exploring and it's cool in that there are just endless varieties and techniques and possibilities um and that's the fishing. There's also fly tying and you can nerd out in those ways too, but, but figure out your own path. And it doesn't have to be like what the authors, the people that live in Montana or whatever, that's fine. You might live in Ohio and there's other cool stuff that you can do. And figuring that out, I think is a lot of fun. And you'll find that there are other diehards out there that are like-minded and, and that community of people that are similarly hardcore, that's a really cool thing. It's, it's a pretty unique aspect about a sport with an intentionally high degree of difficulty that is like the whole point. It's the whole point of it. Um, so figure out the different challenges, and I think you'll find that, that that's the good stuff. Awesome. All right, I'm going to ask you some of the random questions now. All My right. computer, other computer is uh... – there's nothing on the screen, so I'm going to have to wing it. Okay. All right. Uh, if you had a superhero power to make you a better angler, what would you choose? Hmm. I think I'm – no doubt I'm recycling what I've heard other guests say, but the ability to change the weather, so a storm of the X-Men, that's pretty cool because if you've ever seen the weather suddenly shift and then the fishing go from terrible to amazing, uh, I think that could be a pretty cool power. If you left a fishing item at home during the day, what would uh, completely screw you over? 
Hmm. I'd say polarized sunglasses. Do you have a model or brand preference? No, and I, I, I'm probably using something that's totally suboptimal, but picking up the random, you know, sporting goods store, 30 or $40, whatever it was, nothing fancy. Right. But the, the difference between a decent pair and nothing would be disastrous for, for the kind of fishing that I want to do. I want to spot fish and stock them and think about how, how am I going to set the hook when, and if he takes and like for, for that spotting fish is really key. And you'll just hardly ever do that without polarized lenses. What is your local fly shop, your home fly shop? Huh? I would say the I try to support the local fly shops. There's one right on the South Platte at Decker's called Flies and Lies, and that's pretty cool. And so, if, you know, try to restock Tippet and all that from that shop because th those are good guys. And then I would say um, in Boulder, uh, Front Range Anglers is the local shop. You got to get down to Arvada and go see Jay and talk carp fishing with him. Oh yeah, for sure. He used to work at front range anglers and, um, I've been down there once and, uh, met Charlie, Charlie Craven and talked with him and just a super nice guy. Um, if I lived closer, I would say that would be the, the choice for sure. I'd say one good thing about Colorado, it is still a vibrant scene with local fly shops. What's your one bird to tie with that you couldn't live without? Hmm. I would say pheasant. And I was late to this party as usual, but just being cheap. I had never, never bought any and then have some neighbors and friends out here that go pheasant hunting. They go out to Nebraska and then tell them I tie flies. And then suddenly I have more pheasant plumage than I know what to do with. And that's an amazing material. Um, so at this point I'd say no, has no hesitation pheasant um, not just the tails, some of the other feathers as well, but that stuff is great. If a guy named Rufus approached you with a time traveling phone booth, you can go back to a pristine environment to fish. Where would you go? So as I said, kind of growing up fishing the South central Pennsylvania waters, I think what I would pick would be back in the day when Charlie Fox and Vince and those guys were developing uh, terrestrial patterns. Like there didn't used to be ant and grasshopper beetle patterns that w once upon a time, these guys just were looking with binoculars and taking notes and all that. Um, and to be back at that era when they were developing that and, uh, fishing the, the Latorte primarily and the other waters around there, I think that would be really cool. Yeah. The coffee bean fly, the Jason, yeah, shanks right. No shanks hopper, shanks cricket. That's right. A, a, a highlight of mine. My uncle actually set up a guided trip when I um, finished ranger school in the army, and then had a little break before reporting to my first post. Um, he set up a, a guided trip for an afternoon with Ed Coke, who uh, was in that crowd with Charlie and Vince and all those guys. And he was, he was pretty old, but we, uh, we went to the yellow breaches and he told stories and we fished a little bit, but just hanging out with, with Ed on, uh, on some of his favorite spots was, uh, was a ton of fun. That would be pretty cool. Yeah. Those yeah. Old -timers. That, that's, I, I don't know if I sort of grew up with those guys, uh, in my readings because of you being that you were from a, you know, grew up fishing that area, but, you know, my early readings were all based on on those guys, Ring of the Rise, yep. uh, Dry Fly Code. Mm -hmm. And that's where I ended up doing most of my fishing back in the day when I was yeah. single. And I always say when gas was 90 cents a gallon and it didn't cost much to go fishing three hours away for the day. Absolutely. Speaking of authors and books, do you have a favorite author or favorite book people should check out? Hmm. Um. These days, I do more blog reading than book reading, for better or worse. And so I, I would say the Trout Bitten blog by – I'll butcher his last name, but Dominic uh, writes that. That's phenomenal reading. 
and, uh, and writing. It's, and it's fun to read, not just fishing wise and technique wise, though it's great that way, but also just the thinking and why do we do all this and what's it about and manages to maintain perspective. I think I'd say that's something that I would, that I would recommend, uh, very highly. Uh, in addition to the old timers, I already talked about in the ring of the rise and all that, the old Pennsylvania kind of, kind of crew, the modern version of the, the Pennsylvania set, I would point towards trout bitten as okay. the, the best stuff that I'm, that I'm reading. Is there a discontinued fly fishing item that if a listener has and is willing to give up, what would it be? If someone were to send you something that's no longer available. Oh man. I've never been a big gearhead and am cheap at heart. So, uh, I don't know. I have a fondness in my heart for this discontinued Eagle claw, bright yellow fly rod. I think I bought it for 15 bucks back in the day and it was like a broomstick. It was totally stiff, but like I said, fishing like every day, you, you get pretty good muscle memory, even if you have bad gear. And I got super accurate with that thing. And so if, if somehow there were another one of that vintage of the bright yellow Eagle claw rod and the old timers on the yellow breeches would laugh at me, like dudes would actually laugh as I pass by, like, look at this kid. And then I'd start catching fish and, and I used to take pleasure in shutting them up. That's still when I was about catching as many fish as possible. I hadn't, uh, past that maturation stage. So the yellow Eagle claw fly rod, I think it was a four weight that that would be the one. All right. Do you have your toilet paper over or under the roll? Over, of course. I mean, That's come right. on. Yeah. What's the best sandwich you've ever had? Was it the one at the breaches? I bet you had some good sandwiches in New York. There's a lot of good chefs in that Hudson river Valley. Yeah, that was more about calzones and and things I never even knew existed. Uh, you get to know kind of Italian fare. Yeah, I would say nothing was better than being kind of wet and cold but tired from fishing and then getting one of those uh, Boiling Springs gas station. It's probably a Sheets maybe, but uh, little subs out of that place. Those always hit the spot. So they're putting Wawa's in here now. There's going to be one in Vienna. On Maple Avenue. Oh, man. Yeah, that is crazy. Moved 20 years too late. Yeah, that was strictly a Delaware, Pennsylvania kind of phenomenon, as I recall. Yeah, I'm gonna, hopefully they put one in Fairfax. I'll be very happy. Uh, if you go yeah. back in time with Rufus to see a, an athlete play in their prime, who would you go see? Hmm. You know, I grew up an Orioles fan. And I was really young when at the tail end of their, of their glory, they won the world series in 83. And then it was lean years, like big time lean years for a long time, uh, with Cal Ripken as, as a stud, I was always curious about when they were really good in their heyday. So I guess this was late sixties and early seventies and, um, and seeing Brooks Robinson in his prime and, um, you know, the old Oriole pitching staff, because it was like this, this myth I had heard about, but all I knew is these guys are losing like a hundred games a season. So it was uh, hard to imagine them as a, as a dynasty. Do you remember the time you stole Mark McGuire's son's gum? <laughs> Absolutely. We, we, and then Ricky Henderson told me to F off. Yeah. We, uh, for the listeners benefit, we would go to Orioles games and cheap seats and by the seventh inning, and again, when you're losing uh, 90, 100 games, the the fan situation isn't great. This is old Memorial Stadium, not the uh, not the modern, you know, new one. So East 33rd and, and Charles, and uh, yeah, we would we would get down into box seats and probably give a five dollar bill to the 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 ticket guy, and he'd look the other way. So we were in the front row messing with the A's and the on deck circle oh. until Ricky Henderson told you off. <laughs> yeah. And I remember Brian once brought it was like a garbage bag of popcorn. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We sat up in the outfield and we're just gorging on popcorn. Oh my yep. goodness. If you go back in time and see a band in their prime, who would you go see? I would say I would go back and see New Order. So for those that don't know, there was this 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 punk band called Joy Division, 
and charmingly bad, but some genius in there. Their lead singer killed himself. And then the band said, all right, well, what do we do now? And then they, they rebirthed, you know, themselves in a new way and then went on to do very different kind of music as new order. But there was a period in between where they were figuring out what do we want to be? And so people describe the scene at those concerts. You have like punk guys that want to hear the old stuff and then people that are want to hear the new stuff, which is a little bit more new wave ish. Those groups don't necessarily coexist too well. I think that would have been fascinating to, uh, to, to see that. What's one food item you won't eat? Oh man. I'll, I'll, I'll try about everything. I'll say. I'm, I'm, I'm open for, for exploration. All right. What are y'all giving I, out for Halloween this year? What are we giving out? We live in between two cul-de-sacs. It's kind of like the ultimate cul-de-sac. What do you call the street that connects two cul-de-sacs? So like no one comes. So the challenge we have is getting, uh, not over buying. And so, um, something that we know will have extra left over that I won't mind. So probably some nerds. Maybe some almond joys. Have you gotten the nerd Slurpee at Seven <laughs> Eleven? No, it's, it's I, I, remarkable how it tastes exactly like the candy. <laughs> it's rather gross, but it's intriguing. No, I've, I've cut all that stuff out. You try to get healthy. You get old. You have to do these things. I keep saying that to my daughter that Slurpee season's over, but we're gonna have another ninety-three degree day coming up soon. And it's almost October. I'm like, fine, we'll go get another Slurpee. Because yeah. it's supposed to be cold. I'll, I'll usually now. I'll bend the rules on a random hot day, and uh, you know, taking the girls uh, from a lacrosse game or something, and then we'll we'll stop by and get a Slurpee. What's your favorite post fishing meal if you're out by yourself? Are you just gonna go home and meal, or are you gonna hit your favorite little roadside stand? I guess you never got to eat Dorothy's tamales. You know, it's kind of an academic question because invariably I'm running late. I fished longer than I said I was going to. So now I'm going to be home later than I said I was going to. So I'm usually skipping food and driving back as fast as I can and thinking of apologies and excuses. That's usually how it all goes. And I say this because I don't think my wife will listen to the podcast. Um, if I had more time... I would do like you do, like you, you talk about your trips and you, uh, you're looking for some stick to the ribs, like, uh, mashed potatoes and meatloaf kind of place. Mm. That sounds awesome. Yeah. You know? So after some long day of fishing, um, some just classic American fare, stick to the ribs, something with gravy, that would be, that'd be perfect. I like gravy. Big fan of gravy. <laughs> yeah. I now bring my own packet of dry gravy to Thanksgiving because sometimes they'll run out of the real stuff. And I just can't have Thanksgiving without gravy. Is this at your in-laws house? No, <laughs> it's gonna be at Andrew's house this year. I'm smoking oh. a turkey. Yeah, you tell Andrew he can't be running out of gravy. That's that's a that's a rookie move. It is. All right, yeah. what else did I forget to ask you that my computer is, is not working? Now this, this covers it. Look, I've, I've enjoyed it. So yeah, hopefully, uh, and I guess the last thing I'd say in, in terms of your podcast for the listeners out there, if you haven't listened, I don't know what number episode you can add it in or, or something, but there was an episode that you did that marked, I think the one year mark of you being a professional guide kind of out on your own. And I thought that was, uh, an amazingly interesting listen. Because it was the the sound of someone who had taken on something uncertain and is making a go of it and then noticing, hey, in a lot of ways, I'm doing better. Like, I feel better. I'm in a better mood. This this agrees with me. And uh, and it was just uh, personally, it was fun to listen to, to hear that you're doing well. But also whether someone wants to be a fishing guide or whatever, it was like we should all aspire, I think, to find something that that we feel good about. And you don't always pick, you don't always, you know, get that right the first try. And it, it takes a little bit of, uh, of trial and error. So uh, I'd say if anyone's listened this far into the episode, go back and listen to that one. 
And it's uh, it was really fun for me to to listen to. And so now it's a, it's a pleasure to catch up with you years after that um, and see you on YouTube and, and doing your thing. Very cool. Well, Kip Martin, Mac Hodel, thanks for the time today. Absolutely. And we will definitely wait a line if and when I get out there next. Yeah, let's do it. You ever want to go eat Russian food and fish with Yuri? He's he's in Breck for a couple more weeks before he heads back to Columbus. <laughs> Sounds good. Not see if I get away. <laughs> you will not understand a thing he talks about. <laughs> hey, sounds good. All right, man. Yeah, let's let's get together. Sounds see good. You, Rob. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you for joining us for the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast. For more information or to contact Rob, please go to www.robsnowwhite.com. This podcast is brought to you by Freestone Productions at freestoneproductions.com.